Did you recognize the title of the hymn, not the hymn, the sermon this morning? And the people all said, sit down, you're rocking the boat. What is that from? Guys and Dolls. It's from a musical. It's a musical about card-playing, gangster-type guys who fall in love with women who are in an organization that very much looks like the Salvation Army. It's an interesting story, and they just had a revival on Broadway. Now, the story about sitting down and rocking the boat, the song about Don't Rock the Boat comes from a time when they're pretending to give a testimony. And one of these card-playing, dice-throwing guys stands up and in song proclaims that he had a dream. He had a dream that he was on a boat and the boat was headed toward heaven. But he still had his dice in one hand and he had whiskey in his pocket. And the people on their way to heaven said, sit down, boy, you're rocking the boat. And finally, the waves throw him over the side, and it's then that he comes up, and he is a new man. And in the story, in the musical, he's the one who ends up joining the Salvation Army and leaving behind his other ways. Well, I think it's sort of the reverse of that for us in the Church of Jesus Christ, because I think if you decide to follow Jesus, you're going to rock a boat. You're going to rock lots of boats because it's disruptive to follow Jesus in a way that is all-consuming. It disrupts your life. The story that we read this morning, we were not quite sure if, if these men knew Jesus. We read last week about how John had said as Jesus walked by, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says that to Andrew, and Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter and says, I've seen the Messiah. But this is a small place, and they've known each other. They've lived there. And so they may have heard about Jesus or seen Jesus, but he calls them to a new way of life, and they leave their boats and their nets behind. But what are they really leaving behind? For James and John, their father, which seems to be a direct violation, doesn't it, of the word of God. You shall honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. They're leaving their father holding the bag or the net, as the case may be. They're abandoning their work. They're leaving their families and their livelihoods, although there are a lot of scholars who believe that they would stop from time to time in their ministry and fish because they had to earn a living. And we know that Peter had a household to care for because he had a mother-in-law, and you can't have a mother-in-law if you don't have a wife. So these are men who are doing something radical and different, and it's going to rock the boat. I told you when I shared my story of call a few months ago about some of the things that were said to me for being a woman answering the call to ministry. The one that hurt the most came from someone I had grown up with in my youth group who said to me, God does not call women, Satan calls women. You are a servant of Satan. It took me years to make peace with that understanding. But I'm not the only one, and clergy aren't the only one. I spent most of my ministry working with youth. And when I started in professional ministry, it was at a youth director at a church here in Baltimore County. The kids did a 24-hour fast where you go and you stay at the church and you think about fasting and you, you think about Jesus and you give up food for 24 hours and you collect money that goes to a, a hunger mission. One of the girls who had come to church because a friend invited her, just like the kids this morning said, you know, you want to invite a friend to church? That would be a great thing. Well, she was invited by her friends her family was not a family of believers. They didn't attend church, and her father was not just an atheist. He was a hostile atheist. He did not want her to participate in the life of the church, and he told her that. But her mother said, let's let her do it, and she'll probably get it out of her system. I had encouraged the parents and grandparents and members of the church to write notes of encouragement for the kids that we would give them when they got about 20 hours into the fast, because they were getting hungry by then. They were getting really hungry by then. And as all the kids opened the envelopes and read notes of encouragement, notes that said, I'm so proud of you, notes saying, I've been praying for you that you get through this, notes saying, you can be strong for a few more hours. She opened her envelope, and what fell out were magazine pictures of food that her father had cut out. And a note that said, how stupid can you be? And I remember, I wasn't much older than she was at the time, I was in college, just holding her as she sobbed and said, why can't he understand? Well, then when I became a pastor, 
I worked with a pastor, an African-American man, one of the most loving, compassionate, biblically literate, powerful preachers I've ever known. He told me when he went to his first church when he was appointed, they sent him to a white congregation and he got there and found the door was sort of padlocked. The people said they would rather let their church close and worship with him. That was in the 1960s. I worked with him in the 1990s. And unfortunately, in a church that was racially mixed, there were people who he visited faithfully as they were dying. He held their hand as they died and then found out that they had left instructions that he not be allowed to preach their funeral. And I said to him, how do you, how do you keep doing this? Because I was angry and he said, Terry, 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 we are not called to change them, we are called to love them. Then in another church I served another teenager who was on the soccer team, not the school soccer team, one of these leagues, you know how they go. And they called an extra practice because they were going to be going to the tournament. And the extra practice they called was for Easter Sunday morning. And this is a boy who had just gone through confirmation. And this was a boy who was a singer and he loved to sing and God gave him a beautiful voice. He actually sang at my wedding as a teenager. And he went to his parents and he said, I agreed to sing Easter Sunday morning and now we have this practice. And the coach says, if I don't go to practice, I'm not gonna play in the tournament, what do I do? Please tell me that I have to go to church. And they said, you joined the church. You are now a full-fledged disciple of Jesus Christ. It's your call. He said, but what if I want to go play soccer? And they said, it's up to you what you're going to do. Well, he prayed about it. And he went to his coach and he said, I made a commitment to sing in church on Easter Sunday. It's the biggest day in the Christian year. I will not be able to come to practice. And he did not play in the tournament. And for the rest of the season that followed, he was referred to as Father Andrew. Every time he came, the coach would say to the other boys, oh, watch your language, boys. Father Andrew is here, the Holy One. Can you imagine speaking that way to a 17-year-old because he's made a commitment to the church? If you follow Jesus Christ, you're going to rock the boat. You are going to rock the boat. You're going to rock your political world. You're going to rock your family world. You're going to be accused of things that you didn't do or say because people are going to misunderstand you. You're not going to be invited to some of the same parties that you might have been invited to otherwise because it is disruptive to follow Jesus. But it's also life-giving to follow Jesus. And how do we know who we're following? Because we look at what Paul wrote. I love this passage. Corinthians is a powerful book, and I was able to visit ancient Corinth in Greece it's a place that has not been built over, so you can go and actually see the city. You can know exactly where Paul stood when he preached. This shows a little bit about what scripture is really like. You know, there was not a backspace button when you were writing in the first century. There was not an eraser on your quill. So Paul is saying, did I baptize any of you? No. Oh, well, I did baptize you. And then he goes down later and he says, yeah, and I baptized them. But I don't think I baptized anybody else. It's a human document written by a man who is saying to them, Stop fussing with each other over non-essential things because it doesn't matter who baptized you. It doesn't matter who you follow. What matters is Jesus Christ, that you are following Jesus Christ because we're talking about a kingdom now, not a place, not a time. But when you give Christ lordship over your life, that is what is essential. I feel almost that this passage was written for the United Methodist Church in the place we find ourselves right now. But I also look to the passage from Isaiah that we read. We read it during Advent. We read it during Epiphany. And we read it, and it was quoted in the Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, in particular, is written to the very Jewish audience of the time. It has more references to the Old Testament so that people might be able to see that this is the Messiah we've been hoping for. But it mentions Zebulun and Naphtali, places that were taken over by the Assyrians, places that had foreigners, places that were the beginning of that reality that the light of God was going to dawn for all nations. They were going to be restored. They were going to shine forth. 
And then the passage that we use, just one verse of one psalm this morning for the call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? You know how I learned that one? When I was 11 years old, we had a pastor for one year who came out of retirement from the West Virginia Conference where in his heyday he had served as many as a 28-point charge and told me once that he was shot at because they thought he was a revenuer coming to claim their still because he had a tie and a car. One year with this man, he was in his 80s. I was 11 years old. He has had more influence on me than most of the pastors that I had for years and years and years. Every single time he stood in the pulpit to preach, before reading scripture, before opening his mouth, he looked at the congregation and he said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I didn't know then that sometimes you have a lot to fear when you preach a sermon. They might not shoot at you but they might throw a hymnal now and then. Because I can't tell you how easy it is to make people mad just when your name is reverend. We make people mad all the time. We ruffle feathers and we rock boats. A boat's an interesting image, isn't it? For Jesus calling fishermen literally from a boat. I think it was William Sloan Coffin, who was a famed preacher, who said the church is a lot like Noah's Ark, speaking of boats. If it weren't for the stench inside, no one, the storm raging outside, no one could stand the stench inside. We don't always get along with each other, do we? But the image for ecumenism, for the full people of Jesus Christ, is a ship. And it is a rocky ship sometimes. But we can all stay in it together because we are following Christ. Now. This made me think back to the time, and I'm so sorry Kevin Bannister is not here this morning. Kevin Bannister is close to 60 years old himself. I'm telling his secrets now. But he was in my very first youth group. And I was 19 years old. They were 12, 13, 14 years old. They, they thought I was a dinosaur. And for some reason, back in the 70s, rational adult people let their children go with me when I was 19 years old out of state on camping trips. And we went to Cadora State Park near Hanover, Pennsylvania. And one of the things we did together was we rented paddle boats. Have you ever rented a paddle boat? You get in there and you pedal around the water? Well, this was a youth group. And I had one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock. <laughs> and Kevin or one of his brothers decided that was the appropriate time to untie the boat. They got to remember I was 19. I was much thinner and my knees worked. I had both my original knees at that time. They both worked very well, but I never wanted to be a cheerleader in high school. But I did a split that day like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and with flip-flops on my feet, I figured out how to hold on with your toes to the wooden dock and the fiberglass boat. And as I hung there, the guy who rented us the boat said, hey, lady, you can't swim in this water. I said, I got news for you, Jack. I can't swim in any water. <laughs> because my mother thought if we never learned how to swim, we'd never drown because we'd stay away from water. But that's another story. <laughs> but the time came when I had to do what? Fish or cut bait, as they say, right? I had to go one way or the other. I had to go for the dock or the boat because I wasn't going to stay there forever and the other option was not a good one. That's what it is with the kingdom of God and following Jesus Christ. We have one foot in this world and one foot in the kingdom. We have one foot following Christ, one that says, yes, he is my Lord and my Savior, which doesn't just mean lip service in church. It means that Christ is Lord of what I say, what I do, what I think, what I feel, what I keep for myself. Christ is Lord of what comes out of my wallet. Christ is Lord of what comes out of my mouth. That's a decision that you make. But we have a foot in the world, don't we? A world that denies Jesus Christ. All I can tell you is, I have for the best of my ability, and I did go for the boat that day, 
I didn't fall in the water. And we had quite a talk that night in the tent. <laughs> but to the best of my ability, I try to keep both feet in the kingdom of God. It's not always easy. Because some days you want to give up. Some days you want to go back. Some days you want it to be easier. Some days you don't want to be the person who always challenges injustice or opens your mouth or fusses about something. But if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you've got to follow him with all your heart. You've got to follow him with your actions, your words, and your beliefs. Does that mean we're always going to agree with each other? Absolutely not. But if Christ is central to each of us, we can at least extend to each other the grace to understand that while we may not always get it right, we will always be together in the search for our Savior. The light of the world has come. The light of the world is shining in and through us. So don't worry about a net or a rod or a hook or a worm. The best way you will ever bring another person to Jesus Christ is to share your heart, to share your truth, your hope, because it will not fail you, and you will land with both feet in the right place. But don't forget, sometimes you've got to rock the boat to get there. Amen. I invite you to stand and join in singing.